This is GM Word of the Week, and I'm Fiddleback. Glue. We're back. Did you miss us? Of course you did. And we want to thank you all for supporting us and for sticking with us through our brief summer hiatus. Pun intended. Okay, look, we're, we're sorry about the pun, but we're a bit rusty. We've been off for a couple of weeks. It'll come back to us. And soon we'll be adhering to our normally high standards once again. Over the last few weeks, not counting the hiatus, we've taken a look at some of the odder, more out-of-place magical items in Dungeons & Dragons. We've discussed mayonnaise and mountebanks and tried to figure out just how those things fit into the game we all love. But among all the weird, out-of-place items in the multiverse of D&D, one stands out. It's not just that it's weird and seems oddly anachronistic, it's that despite all that, Many gamers have acknowledged it as one of the most versatile and powerful magical items in the history of the game. Despite its apparent innocuousness, if you search its name online, you'll find megs and megs of websites devoted to the billion and one uses for this singular item. That item is Sovereign Glue. By the way, the word anachronism which refers to something that appears to be out of its correct place in history, like the police officers that ended the standoff in Monty Python and the Holy Grail, comes from the Greek. Anna is a prefix that means backwards. Chronos is the Greek word for time. See? Digressions about word origins. We're getting back in the groove. But Sovereign Glue. Sovereign Glue is a weird little magical item that has grown less complex with time. One of the earliest incarnations was in the Advanced Dungeons & Dragons 2nd Edition Dungeon Master's Guide. It was described as a vial of about 10 ounces of amber fluid. If you applied an ounce of the fluid to anything, and then put anything else on it, the two would stick together. Forever. Unbreakably. Any attempt to separate the two objects would destroy the objects before it could ever destroy the glue. For the past two and a half decades, Players and GMs alike have wreaked havoc with this unbreakable instant set superglue. But what made it complicated was the weird list of interactions and complications that came along with it back in the second edition days. For example, in order to keep it from gluing itself inside its own container forever, you had to treat the container with another magical item called the Solve of Slipperiness. And every time you dispensed some of the glue, you needed more Solve to keep the rest from drying out. You could also ruin the bond by turning the objects ghostly by using oil of etherealness. And there was one thing that could dissolve the sovereign glue completely. But we'll come back to that. The thing with sovereign glue is that it manages to seem completely anachronistic and completely mundane at the exact same time. Anyone who has worked with model cement or epoxy or gorilla glue knows what it means to have a permanent unbreakable bond formed between their skin and a half-assembled pewter figure of Tiamat. There's no magic to that. And we all know what happens to Elmer's glue inside that container if you don't use it up pretty much within one week of buying this stuff. There's nothing fantastic about superglue that sticks to its own container given enough time. But it's also something we think of as fairly modern. What's interesting, though, is that it isn't as anachronistic as we might think. See, while we are used to synthetic glues like Elmer's and Epoxy and so on, these glues are merely improvements on natural adhesives that have been in use for thousands of years. For example, it is likely that ancient humans used bitumen, a tar-like substance, to glue flint tips to their wooden spears. In some Babylonian temples, we've discovered ivory eyeballs glued into the eye sockets of some statues. And this glue has held for 6,000 years. Archaeologists have discovered pottery from 4000 BC that was broken and glued back together. King Tutankhamun's casket was partially constructed with glue. And the Romans and Greeks developed a variety of furniture construction techniques that involved layering glue and thin planks of wood. But then, suddenly, the use of adhesives dropped off. During the Middle Ages, glues fell out of flavor and didn't reappear until around 1500 CE. So, 
unless you stick strictly to the idea of mirroring the Middle Ages in your D&D game when glues fell into disuse. There's nothing particularly out of place about glue. And as mundane as they seem, you have to admit there is something weirdly magical about a substance that forms an unbreakable bond between two things just by drying. It is pretty fantastic. Unless you understand something about the twin chemical forces of adhesion and cohesion. Cohesion is a chemical force that causes substances to stick to themselves, and they are actually the result of molecular and atomic bonds. You might remember from high school chemistry that all matter is made of atoms of particular elements. And those atoms, by sharing or transferring electrons around, clump together into substances called molecules. And it all comes down to the idea that there are certain numbers of electrons that are preferred by the universe. For example, atoms really love having exactly two electrons orbiting them. Or exactly ten. It's a little more complicated than that, but those are the basics. Anyway, take a hydrogen atom. It has exactly one electron, and it really wants another. Oxygen atoms have exactly eight electrons, and really want two more. So if two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom set up a little joint custody agreement, the oxygen gets partial custody of one electron from each of the two hydrogen atoms. And the hydrogen atoms can borrow some time with one of oxygen's electrons each. And so, the two hydrogen atoms and the one oxygen atom stick close together like a bunch of divorcees living in a small town so they can share custody of the kids. And that's how water happens. But often, these custody agreements are a bit unfair. Oxygen is a tough bastard and it puts up a fight. So the electrons spend more time with the oxygen than with the hydrogen. And that makes things a little uneven. So the hydrogen atoms, desperate for more time with their electrons, get depressed and start spending time at the playground watching other molecules playing with their electrons, or hanging out in the maternity ward of the hospital. The end result is that water molecules like to be near other water molecules because of all that uneven sharing. See, electrons are negatively charged. And if the electrons spend more time on one side of the molecule than the other, that side of the molecule gets more negatively charged, and the other side gets more positively charged. And because opposite charges attract, the positive side of one water molecule sticks to the negative side of another water molecule, and so water molecules tend to clump up into droplets. Now, there are other forces that are even stronger. For example, Iron is a complete mess. It's not just wanting one more electron or looking to give up just one. It's got a lot of holes to fill and a lot of mouths to feed. So iron atoms tend to clump up and pass all of their electrons around in a big soup. Like those kids who have a different play date at a different house every day. And so it is very hard to get iron to separate from iron. These same forces can occur between different substances. Salt is made of positive sodium and negative chlorine. And if you put salt in water, the attraction between the different sides of the water molecules with the different parts of salt is strong enough to rip the salt apart. And that's why salt dissolves in water. It's these forces that create cohesion and adhesion. Well, sort of. It turns out that adhesion is very, very complicated. And because of the number of different ways that atoms and molecules and substances can stick together, Two substances that adhere can adhere for any number of reasons. The simplest is absorption, which relies on those molecular forces to stick the substances together. Water tends to get in the way of those forces, which is why such glues have to dry before they stick. There's also chemisorption, which is what makes model cement stick to plastic. The glue literally melts the plastic into a new chemical that forms the bond. And finally, there's mechanical adhesion, in which the glue slips into all the tiny little holes and imperfections in the two surfaces and grips them together. But even if it isn't entirely anachronistic, and even if we accept that there is a magic to the way glue works, one might wonder why magical glue ended up in D&D in the first place. And the answer to that, as near as we can tell, is because of the opposite of sovereign glue. 
Remember when we said there was one substance that could dissolve sovereign glue? It's another magical liquid called universal solvent. And universal solvent is not just a weird magical chemical that someone stuck into D&D because you needed a way to break magical crazy glue. Universal solvent actually has historical significance. And that brings us around to the science of alchemy. Alchemy is, of course, the ancient study of... Well, it's kind of hard to define. Today we think of alchemy as making magical potions and gunpowder and tanglefoot bags. But alchemy was a massive, incredibly complex pursuit. And it had a number of important goals. In fact, alchemy was the forerunner to modern chemistry. If you've read the Harry Potter books, you might know that alchemy was a medieval science that was devoted to finding the recipe for the Philosopher's Stone. This mythical substance was essentially the purest substance that existed, and it was made of a divine element known as the quintessence. Among its properties was its ability to purify the body, cure disease, and extend life. But you might also know of alchemy as the pursuit of transmutation, changing impure substances into pure substances, the most famous of which was turning base metals like lead into royal metals like gold. But that's really selling alchemy short. Western alchemy actually started in ancient Egypt. The trouble is, we're not quite sure how. We do know that there was an Egyptian philosopher king who studied and wrote extensively on the subject of alchemy. And we do know that attempts were made to destroy his place in history by later Egyptian rulers. And we know that some of his writings survived. Most famously, a set of tablets called the Emerald Tablets. And this figure, or he may have been several figures, was conflated with the Egyptian god of wisdom, Tote, and the Greek god Hermes. And so he was named Hermes Trimestigistus, or Hermes the Thrice Great. Hermes T laid out the basic foundation for Egyptian alchemy, which then spread across Greece, into the Arab world, and on into Europe. It endured as a science and a mystical art for thousands of years, and the history of alchemy and its notable figures is incredibly interesting, but it would take hours to even scratch the surface. And we've got only what's left in this 20-minute chunk of your life, so we're going to have to abbreviate and leave a lot for another episode. Alchemists had many obsessions. Everlasting life and fabulous wealth are the most famous, but also the least interesting and the least fair. From the beginning, alchemy was a true science concerned with understanding the nature of the universe and the substances that filled it. The famous quote, as above, so below, that has been used time and again to theorize that an understanding of the mundane physical laws of the universe will provide insight into higher order spiritual laws and metaphysics that phrase originally came from the Emerald Tablets. Alchemists sought to understand the relationship between the natural and the spiritual world. They sought to understand how different substances related to each other. And one chemical pursuit was the pursuit of the universal solvent. The universal solvent was a hypothetical substance that could dissolve anything placed into it. And it was thought to be invaluable in medicine. See, if you have something that has certain properties that might help the body, and you can dissolve it in a liquid, you can drink it and gain the benefits. The universal solvent would also be invaluable in reducing substances to their purest state. In the early 1500s, a Swiss alchemist named Paracelsus even came up with a recipe that was a mixture of lime, alcohol, and potassium carbonate. It was such a useful mixture that it endures today and remains a favorite way to clean the laboratory glassware. He called it Alkahest. Sadly, a true universal solvent was never discovered. And some even pointed out that if it were discovered, it would be at best useless or at worst outright dangerous. If you have a substance that dissolves absolutely everything, no container could hold it and it would eventually eat through the entire world like that acid in Aliens. Interestingly enough, and to bring this back to chemistry, today many chemists refer to water as the universal solvent. Remember that whole thing about unbalanced water molecules that are really good at pulling stuff apart? Well, water is amazingly good at dissolving substances. In fact, the unique chemical properties of water that make it good at dissolving stuff 
also make it invaluable in many chemical processes that are vital for life, or so we currently believe. The polarity of water, the imbalance of its charges, makes it useful for forming or breaking chemical bonds, dissolving substances, sticking together, and even expanding when it freezes. So yeah, Sovereign Glue is kind of weird and non-fantastic and apparently modern and it might seem out of place in D&D. But when you put it together with a universal solvent, which has thousands of years of alchemical history behind it, it suddenly makes sense. How is any of this useful in your game? Well, truth be told, the glue is just fun to play with. There are so many things that players and GMs can do with it, we could spend an hour just listing those. But we'll talk about one fantastic trap we used years ago when the word Gygaxian was not a dirty word. Sure, you can spread sovereign glue around a treasure chest on the floor in a misty room and the PCs won't notice and they will step on it. The trouble is, all they do is glue their boots to the floor. They step out of their boots and they're fine. The trick is to get their boots off. So around the glue trap you put a little moat or puddle that the players have to walk through. Just a few inches of water treated with a mixture of two magical oils. The first casts a shrinking spell on any object that it touches, like boots. The second casts heat metal on any object that it touches, like greaves. After the players cross through that, their boots start shrinking or start burning and they have to take them off. Then comes the sovereign glue. Fun, right? This has been the GM Word of the Week. It was written by the Angry GM and recorded and produced by me, Fiddleback. You can find more at theangrygm.com and madadventurers.com.